Glass Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. You all ready for this? Mm -hmm. dun, 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 this dun. is a <laughs> sham. No. No. Nope. Just stop. Get real. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to DBL. There is a big, big verdict that was just handed down today. The jury for the school shooter in Parkland, Florida, rejected the death penalty. Instead, they recommended a life sentence for the 24-year-old shooter who pled guilty. As is our policy here at DBL, we do not show, we do not name mass shooters. For more on this, and we are so lucky to have him, we are joined by attorney and legal analyst Whitney Trailer. Thank you so much for being here, Whitney. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. It's a complicated Today and we yes. need you, so thank you for being here. Yes. Uh, Lindsay, do you have the first question, I think? Got it. So um, why do you think the jury decided against the death penalty, especially in this kind of case? Well, it's so tough. I mean, when you're on a jury, you have to remember we're one of the few countries in the world that has a jury, and it's made up of everyday citizens. And even though people were asked, could you impose the death penalty, when it comes time to do it, it's so much more challenging. You sat, you watched the trial, they heard the various defenses about how the upbringing and things. So it is tough to get a, a uh, death penalty conviction. Do you think the jury was swayed in any way by the defense argument that the shooter suffered from fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, meaning the mother was an alcoholic while the baby was in the womb? I think that must have been effective because there was so much evidence obvious here. The, the defense was not trying to uh, put forward a, a not guilty. They were really just trying to avoid the, the, yeah. the death penalty. So in a way, this was a, a defense victory, if you will. So I, that, that defense must have worked. I wasn't in the deliberation rooms, right. but obviously, the, the outcome, I think, proves that. Mm -hmm. I just got to say, defense victory is an understatement. I was shocked yeah. by this. I don't agree with the death penalty separate issue, but I was shocked that the jury did not convict this man to death. And I just wanted to get our take, DBL here. Lindsay, Jeff, how did you feel when, because it just sort of broke. How did you feel, Linz, when you got it? I was really, I still am shocked. Yeah, I was kind of wondering in our country, what's the death penalty for? Or who is it for if not for the man who killed children? That's a fair you know, point. That's, what, that's where I would think, it, even though I don't think it should, it's used sometimes too leniently when, or you know, with mm -hmm. too much leniency because some people are wrongfully on death yeah, row. Right. But this is a man we all know, 100% sure, yeah. killed kids. Yes. So who would it be reserved for if not him? Well, and that may speak to the uh, skill of the attorney as well, to really play on the sympathies of the jury, to really connect with them and to let them see some kind of human connection. Because that's uh, hard to do with this monster, right? How do you feel? You must have been outraged. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for more discipline. I know a lot of people don't have that take with the death penalty. I definitely do. And having watched um, the new Jeffrey Dahmer trial, which is a very pro popular, I'm sorry, the new D Dahmer series, it goes into depth about everything. But one part that you don't know is that when he got to jail he received fan mail and money for his commissary Jesus. and he became like this hero in his own mind and he, and he would walk through like the lunchroom like with a strut saying my fans love me mm -hmm. and this is if he didn't get what I call natural selection and all that he got murdered in jail and I, I think that was his rightful destiny mm -hmm. I don't think this person should be allowed fans or conjugal visits or f uh, family in the future because people said he's changed mm -hmm. you shot up a school you ruined hundreds of lives mm -hmm. not just the ones that you killed broken forever now people are copying your exact moves that you have done we have to make we have to be more disciplined what we do. My, my ideology would be to kill them on the spot. If you walk out of the school with a gun, you should be put down like the dog that you are. So Sorry. do you think that if there was a death penalty that that would I, have a deterrent effect on somebody who's with this ideology I that do. they're saying, well, I could be put to death? I do, because I think and again, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but I think a lot of them do it for notoriety. Mm. They have nothing going on in their lives. They were picked on, bullied for whatever reason, their upbringing was broken, mm -hmm. and they want to prove themselves that they're not who everyone thinks that they are. That's in my mind. I'm yeah, not okay. a psychologist, but I do believe in that. I appreciate your take. Everyone write us in. It's going to be a big day for hearing from you guys. So YouTube, our app, we really want to hear from you. I am, again, aghast that in Florida, this didn't go to the death penalty. As you said, sir, the defense had a victory on this mm -hmm. one, in my yeah. opinion. Yep. Uh, we're going to move on to another big trial, another monster, in my opinion. That's Alex Jones. He's the far-right talk show host. You might know him. He's been ordered to pay, 
I've never heard this before, nearly $1 billion to eight families of Sandy Hook shooting victims and one of the first responders on the scene. So this is a huge verdict and it comes after he spread lie after lie on his show saying the shooting was staged and the families were just crisis actors. Now the families were in court, okay, when the verdict was read. Oh my God. Mm. Some cried. It's just such a relief of emotions. Many of them testified about all the harassment against them as a result of Alex Jones's lies. I know many of them had to move several times. Now, Alex was not in the courtroom. Instead, he was live streaming, of course he was, on his own show, reacting to the verdict. You can see him cheer and mock it. He also vowed not to stop questioning school shootings. Let's take a look. They want to scare everybody away from freedom and scare us away from questioning Uvalde and what really happened there or, or Parkland or any other event. And guess what? We're not scared and we're not going away and we're not going to stop. And literally for hundreds of thousands of dollars, I can keep them in court for years. I can appeal this stuff. We can stand up against this travesty, against the billions of dollars they want. It's a joke. He is a bankrupt person in financially and morally. That is outrageous. So how much money will these families actually get? Jones said he's going to appeal and said they're, quote, ain't no money to pay. The parent company for his show has also filed for bank bankruptcy. But get this, Jones is now asking for donations from his fans. Sorry I got so editorial on that one. That's hard to read and not feel a right. certain emotion. How do you feel about this? Well, the case is, is outrageous. I think the verdict was, was correct. And actually, there were two trials. There was the Texas trial, which he already got hit with a multi-million dollar verdict, and then this one in Connecticut. But both of them, he actually got a default judgment against him because he didn't produce in civil lawsuits, you have to produce certain discovery. He didn't produce evidence that they believe shows he actually knew that this happened. He also didn't produce evidence related to how much money he made off of promoting the, the hoax mm. because the theory is that he was he knew that this was uh, he was lying but he knew that the, it would get followers and money and all these other things and so this judgment I think so there was a default judgment on liability the jury only had to decide damages mm -hmm. and they came back with this huge verdict and I'm not surprised because you can imagine having a child die in that way can't even comprehend that in and then the um, harassment, people urinated on, on the, the grave sites. They were threatening to rape them. All of this when for 10 years they haven't been able to grieve and you can directly correlate his comments to the harassment. So this seemed like a just result in terms of this huge verdict. I think quickly people want to know our family is going to be able to collect at all. Well, there's two issues. So appeal, when you appeal, it, it sort of, uh, you, you can't collect. It stops but, it all, right? Well, generally you have to post what's called a supersedious bond. So you have to post a bond because, you know, I sued a, a major corporation, they appealed it, and they had to post a bond even though they were this major corporation because they might have been out of uh, business. So so that's one thing. He'll have to post some kind of bond, so the appeal will take some time. And then if he files for bankruptcy, if he files for bankruptcy, that stops all litigation. Mm -hmm. But they can go in and fight to keep it out of litigation, which gets a little more let's, technical. Let's pick it up at the break a little bit. Yeah, we'll go more into detail. This is fascinating, yeah. and people really want to know this. What a reckless individual. Whitney, thank you so much for being here and breaking all of this down. For more information on Whitney Trailer, please go to his website at WhitneyTrailer.com or on Instagram. Nice. Check us out on YouTube right now. And and check us out on YouTube right now at, uh, excuse, go back on the prompter, go back, thank you, at YW Trailer. We'll I be hope right that's back. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll I explain in sure. the break. <laughs> Closed captioning provided by. It's so easy. I'm going to sleep tickle, y'all. Yeah, I take love much. it. <laughs> You're going to sit here and okay. be right. I, have, I know y'all going to be mad at me, but I'm just telling you the truth. You can smirk all you want. You don't have to tell me to go. <laughs> Brad Pitt. <laughs> <on the> <laughs> the question okay. everybody wants to know yeah. the answer to are people ever going to get their money yeah and so that we never mm -hmm. answer that question it's just like okay they owe 900 billion they owe yes. you know million i mean yeah. 10 million but are these families who've been hurt and literally financially put out going to get any recoupment of their funds? hopefully they will i mean on the appeal maybe the verdict may get reduced i don't see the appeal the case getting overturned so that's one thing then on the bankruptcy i see them fighting to keep this out of bankruptcy 
which I think they will be able to. So the families will yeah. be able to collect. Okay, and wait, let's move over here and talk. And that's the, the that, then becomes, that then becomes the issue, is how the families collect. So our system has this whole mechanism system. set up. So once you sue and get a judgment, you can collect. You can do a Rule 69 deposition. You can garnish wages. You can file the judgment, and it acts as a lien. So you file it where he has property. So if he has, goes bankruptcy, does that protect him from having to pay? Is that a get out of jail, you know, get it out of may. money pay? So one of the points of bankruptcy it, is it stays the litigation. So Donald Trump has used bankruptcy all the time. Right. He said, I'm using the bankruptcy laws to my advantage. Right. He's not saying I'm broke or whatever. Right, right. So it's, it does stop the litigation. But in bankruptcy, if you can show it was an intentional tort, you can keep it out of bankruptcy. Okay. And here they will be able to keep it out of bankruptcy. And what about like defamation after he already defamed these families? Right. Can he this keep, going? keep going? Exactly. No, I think a judge is probably going to essentially issue a gag order. Yeah. But if he keeps going and keeps is making money, this is it could be it contempt. It could be contempt of yes, court, right? For sure. But this is if he's getting donations and making this money, he's getting all these other. Um, He's uh, allowing the families to be able to collect because yeah. more money he makes. They make. They, they make. You guys gonna talk more about? Welcome back to DBL. We're less than a month away from the midterm elections. There are some stories out there about candidates you may find on your ballot this November. And let's be real, these are some of the only options you'll have available to you, for real. Up first is the mayor race in LA. At the debate yesterday, mayoral, mayoral candidate Rick Caruso corrected the Telemundo anchor who called him a white man. Caruso said, quote, I'm Italian. When the anchor said Italian American, Caruso once again corrected him, saying, That's Latin. Thank you. The moment led to a bunch of accusations online. Was that appropriating culture to win votes? What do we think about this? I'm going to my Italian brother here. How do you feel about this? Are you saying I'm not white? <laughs> don't go there. Is that what? I don't know. I don't know. If my life could change <laughs> from here on out. Um, no, l l my let's life put away change. the ridiculousness, right? I'm only half Italian. I grew up in an uh, all-Italian neighborhood. Not once ever in my whole life Did have anybody. anybody ever <laughs> referred to themselves as Latin. Okay. Uh, that's never. Right. But never. also, like, <laughs> L.A. as a whole, like, y'all need to reel it in with the, you know, Spanish population and the black population and what y'all are doing with racist comments. Let's all reel it in because with the Nuri Martinez, you know, she's a, a leader over there saying racist stuff recently. We haven't touched on that story, but she's calling black recording. people monkeys. Yeah, black kid children. And now you have this white guy saying, I'm also Latin. Like, why don't y'all reel it in? Just run your race and stop talking about race unless you have something real to say or something that's going to actually be beneficial to the diverse population that you represent. Mm, very I well mean, said. Like, very well said. If you don't know what she's talking about, Google the LA Council City Council audio recording. Right. You'll get a whole new story. Now we're going to move on to Nevada. This is Republican Senate candidate Adam Lacks Alt, I hope I'm saying that correctly, who is running against Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. But get this, 14 members of Laxalt. I think it's family. LAX ATLs, right? Is that what it is? Or is it Laxalt? Oh, it's Laxalt? Laxalt? Okay, sorry. Okay, family signed a three-page letter endorsing his rival. In response, Laxalt got another 22 members of his family to write an op-ed backing him. But the question is, would you support a candidate if their family spoke out against them and in favor of their opponent? Whew! Tori, take it away. Yeah, what, I'm so like I'm a little, off. yeah, that kind of like. I thought I was, I thought I was like, had a connecting flight somewhere. I thought while we were going to Atlanta, I know from LA. Here's what I say. I do think family is important when you look at a candidate as a whole. And I think voters, especially ones that aren't interested in deep, detailed politics, look to see if your family is in good standing with you. That means something to people. Yeah, and it should, right? It should. But look at I, her show, Walker. I do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. But I think a lot of the upcoming elections are going to come down to just breaking people's character. Yeah. Right. You're not this race. You're that race. But if you don't vote for this race, you're that person. My family's this and they're that. It's going to be all about character mm. and not about any policies is which I'm af what I'm afraid of. I was going to say, because that's not the way yes. it should be. We'll be right back. Are you ready for a fresh? On October 11th, this video claiming to show an American stealth bomber landing in Poland for the first time was shared widely on Twitter. 
The Post pointed out that the B-2 Spirit is capable of carrying multiple nuclear weapons. The video was also shared on Telegram channels that share news about the war in Ukraine, where it was viewed thousands of times. So let's verify. Does a viral video show a U.S. stealth bomber landing in Poland during the current Russia-Ukraine war? Our sources are reverse image search tool Revi, Google Maps, the U.S. Department of Defense, and clips posted by YouTube user Chris Smith. To trace this video, verify first split the clip into individual frames, sort of like taking a screenshot. We then used Revi to do a reverse image search and found a mirror image of the same frame of video was posted on YouTube in April 2020 by Smith. The caption in that video says it shows the bomber landing at England's Royal Air Force Base in Fairford, not Poland. You can see the same person standing near the road and the same body of water in the background as the plane flies over. We then used Google Maps to find the approximate location where the clip was recorded. The same green fence and airport equipment are visible in both. Finally, we found this video from the U.S. Department of Defense that shows the same B-2 bomber being serviced at RAF Fairford in March 2020. So no, a viral video does not show a U.S. stealth bomber landing in Poland during the current Russia-Ukraine war. Verify also reached out to the Department of Defense about the claim, but did not receive a response. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. Welcome back to DBL. Not only is she an amazing actress and producer, but she's also a killer singer and has a new album filled with duets from some musical legends like Willie Nelson. Earlier, we spoke with the Rita Wilson. Take a look. So Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. I kind of just wanted to pour like a little glass of wine and yeah. wrap myself up in a blanket. <laughs> yeah. that. that sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> a little early. Yeah, yeah. So, Rita, all the duets on your album, Now and Forever, are famous hits from the 1970s. What is it about the music of that decade? Why choose that era? Well, it's... For me, those songs are still resonant. They, people still sing them. People still cover them. And... Uh, they're classics in an odd way. And I feel like I had this sort of connection in my mind between the Great American Songbook and those songs and the 70s. Because in the Great American Songbook, you had, in many cases, people writing for musicals. And in those musicals, those great writers were writing for people to sing from a first-person point of view. And I bridged that into the 70s, where the 70s was the birth, really, of the singer-songwriter. And what were they doing? Writing from a first-person point of view. So I made that connection, and I thought maybe that's why these songs still last and we still love them so much. Oh, I live for a musically nostalgic moment. So <laughs> I, I'm here for exactly where you're like, I know exactly where. Okay. But okay, let's talk about the gram because you posted a throwback photo on your Instagram. So how did music help you through your teen years? And was there a specific song you turned to Ooh. for your musically nostalgic moment um, to get through tough times? Well, um, music was always played in my house. I'm actually standing in front of the hi-fi, as we all probably had at some point, which <laughs> was a TV, it. a tuner, and a turntable. And we always were playing music. Uh, in that case, we were playing probably Beatles albums, but the radio was always on. My mom is Greek. My mom was Greek. My dad was Bulgarian, and I'm a first-generation American. And yet my mom had this really keen ear for music. And so we would be driving in the car and she would say something like listening to a song, you know, that song going to be a hit. <laughs> you know, teenage me, I'd be like, no, no, you know nothing about music. And, you know, cut to two weeks later, it's number one. But she also gave me a sense of perspective on how to interpret a song differently. And music, I'd say, listen, if you go through the whole era of 
Joni Mitchell, Carol King, Linda Ronstadt, Carly Simon, you know, any one of those songs would have captured my mood. And uh, that whole, that those women, Stevie Nicks, incredible songwriters. Yeah, and you remember like the times and the places, what you're going through, it just triggers everything. And your album, I mean, let's talk about it. Jackson Brown, Elvis Costello, Vince Gill, Willie Nelson, Smokey Robinsons, those are just some of your duets. Working with so many legends, I have to ask, which recording was the most emotional for you? Oh, gosh, you know, when we were making this album, it all felt very emotional because people were coming to the sessions with their own personal histories with these songs, whether they had their own experiences with each song or you think about the writers who wrote the songs and brought them to. But it was very emotional to have somebody like Smokey Robinson, uh, one of the great songwriters of all time, singing uh, with me on Where is the Love. And then there's Willie Nelson and I singing um, Slip Sliding Away, which to me, if you hear Willie Nelson, who's almost 90, sing a lyric, the nearer your destination, the more you're slip sliding away, one would think, wow, that's evocative. But I don't think anybody is getting anywhere near slip sliding away besides Willie. Wow. What a way to put that. I know. Congratulations, Rita. It, it's amazing. Thank, Thank you so much you. For, yes. for joining us today. The, the Smokey Robinson. I listened to that this pleasure. morning. That was you amazing. Did? Oh, the Smokey. I'm sorry, really quickly. <laughs> that just took me back to my grandmother's house, so I appreciate Aww. you for that. I was like, I love there that song. You Thank you. Go Thank you. Album. It'll bring back more out memories. That's right. So, DBL appreciate Nation, it. listen to Rita's album, Now and Forever Duets, available now. Let's take another listen as we head to break. Here's Songbird with Rita and Josh Groban. Thanks again, Rita. Thanks, Rita. Thank you. Bye. Promotional consideration is brought to you by. If you've spent any time working in the public sector, listen up. More people who've worked in public service can apply for total loan relief, or at least make progress towards it, but just through the end of this month. Let's verify the details. Our sources are the Department of Education, the White House, and Melissa Byrne, student loan you've forgiveness advocate. Work. You've done the work of public service. Scoop this up and be done with your loans. The program is for borrowers in government, military, public schools, public child and family service agencies, and special government districts like transportation or housing authorities, no matter the specific job. The Department of Education website explains the PSLF program can wipe out remaining federal direct student debt after 120 monthly payments under a repayment plan and 10 years of working full time in a qualified job. However, the White House website explains because of issues with the program's eligibility and implementation in the past, quote, many borrowers have not received the credit they deserve for their public service. You might have been denied in the past, but because of the waiver, it's really important that you go and apply. Just until October 31st, 2022, Fell and Perkins loans can also be eligible and repayments under any repayment plan, even if they were late or for less than the amount due or before consolidation can count toward the 120 required payments. An applicant does not need to be currently working for the qualified employer and teachers can now count additional time of service toward the PSLF requirements. People left and right are realizing that they have the 120 payments and even if you don't have the 120 payments yet, if you get your application in, it brings everything up to date and gets you on track to get it. There's a big effort from advocates to get the word out on this. A group of lawmakers recently told the Secretary of Education that only a small percentage of people who could benefit from this program have applied. Check out this story on our website for more information on applying and if this applies to you. With your Verify, I'm Abby Larico. Dennis and Jane Durham saw this post circulating Facebook and asked me to verify if it's true. It claims the coloration of the woolly bear caterpillars, also called woolly worms, predict the upcoming winter. If the woolly bear is mostly black, it means a harsher winter. If mostly brown, it means a milder one. If brown at the head with more black near the tail, it means a winter that starts mild and ends harshly. To verify, we turn to the National Weather Service and Frank Fowler. They conclude that claim is false. There's been a lot of studies, a lot of folklore about the woolly bear, and um, no studies have ever concluded that they actually can predict um, future weather events. However, 
the coloration and the uh, and the, the length of the bands do have a correlation to how severe the previous winter was. When they're born in the spring, they're all black, and the more warm growing season they have, the, the wider that brown rust-colored band becomes in the middle. The National Weather Service notes the coloring also indicates the age of the caterpillar. Each time it sheds its coat, it becomes redder. As for why the insects are so furry, Fowler said the coat protects them from freezing down to negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit. In conclusion, we verified no woolly bear caterpillars can't predict the upcoming winter, but their coloring can indicate the severity of the previous one. We got some great products for you today from our friends at Morning Save. Check them out. Steph, what do you have for us today? Hey, Tori and hey, DBL Nation. We are so excited to show you the deal today. Tori, this has got our name on it. Oh. It is the two-pack tan towel <sighs> instant glow lotion. <laughs> You're right. So this deal includes two ultra hydrating lotions. So what will happen with this is it's gonna give your skin a really instant glow, a hint of bronze, oh, yeah. and it will gradually build into a sun safe, healthy sun kiss glow. Mm. Normally it's $56. Mm. Now it's $17.99, oh, which man. saves 68%. That sun kissed look is all oh, I yes. want. All day, every day. So. Now this one, Tori, we've got the Palm N. RG Deluxe Massage Gloves and Socks Pain Relief and Recovery System. So the massager uses electrical muscle stimulation to strengthen and rehabilitate your muscles. Normally, it's $189. Yeah. But we've got it for just $39.99. No. So that saves 79%. My mom has restless leg syndrome, and I bet this would be great at night for her yes. to relax on. Tori, we've got the four-pack Finding Home Home Farms 10 ounce soy candles. Love. Each candle is a different scent. Normally this set is $120. Ooh. But now you can get four candles for just $24.99. Oh. Which saves everyone 75%. I love candles. And then Tori, we've got Fultz Graf Southport 45 piece flatware set constructed from superior quality 180 stainless steel and will stand up to everyday use. Normally they're $120. I was like, this is always going to be an expensive item. Oh, yeah. Right. But guess what, Tori? We have got the set for $49.99, which saves everyone up to 58 mm. cents. Fork over those savings. <laughs> <laughs> Head on over to MorningSave.com to snag these amazing deals at the lowest prices, or you can just scan the QR code on screen. It'll take you directly to these products on MorningSave's website. Steph, thank you so, so much. These are great. My favorite part is when I just looked at camera and went, I love candles. <laughs> that was my that was, favorite too. It was all of ours. <laughs> DBL's new every day. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. Be good to yourselves. Bye guys.